Hello everyone and welcome to a special edition of the Channel 5 News. I am Kenny Williams. Coming up, head of Dominica's police force says regional counterparts played a vital role in securing the country post-Hurricane Maria. Police Chief Daniel Carbon has once again uh, come to the defense of his men uh, against the criticism that they did not do enough early enough in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Speaking at Wednesday's government press briefing, the police chief noted that without the help of the regional forces, the Dominica police force would not have been able to manage in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. As the storm on range is havoc, I was with some of my men at the and I say not that you understand the, the magnitude of the impact on what my men went through. I was at the admin block. The admin block was flooding. And I could feel that the admin block, which is the top floor, shaking. And I told my men that it is not safe to stay on the top floor. Let us try to go down at ground level. And all of them followed me, and when we reached at the ground level, the water was at wayside. The Rosu River was flooding the city of Rosu to include headquarters with mud and debris. And it's not that it was flooding, but it was almost raging, the water. So I told them, let us go back to the immediate floor, intermediate floor, which is where the CID is. And we spend the rest of the storm there. And when daylight came and I peeped out and I saw, I looked at Kings Hill and Mount Bruce, I said, Lord, my evaluation was right. And while that was happening in the storm, in the center, in the heat of the storm, there were officers receiving telephone communication from their spouses. And some of them cried. Some of them broke down and started crying. And I told them, that is the work of the hands of God. And he, God, will see us through it. You cannot cry to your wife. Yes, she has a free four months old baby. But you cannot, she alone there. You cannot cry because you have to give her the support. And that is the very officers, 80, 75 to 80% of their roof and their buildings were damaged. <coughs> and that is the very officers, those are the officers who attempted to go while the storm was still in passage to secure the city of Rosso and had to return, could not drive, could not walk. And as daylight, notwithstanding their situation and not knowing anything about their families, ventured in the city of Rosso to try to secure business places. And the officers have been there ever since. Some of them are sick and they're still on the job. And that is one of the hallmark of the achievement of the CDPF. Another important matter discussed at uh, Wednesday's press briefing was the role that the regional officers will play in Friday's independent celebrations. We have to draw down the parade. But the parade, even if it is drawn down, is going to be solid. It is going to be solid because we have all the regional forces taking part on the parade. Jamaica Defense Force, Trinidad at Defense Force, the RSS Regional Security System, and as of yesterday, the Defense Force from the Bahamas joined us. And so we will have each of the forces per platoon on the parade. And so the parade is going to be solid. We taken a decision that we must have the review order. And the president will inspect the guard of honor 
on his arrival. Following which, he will take his seat, and then after the addresses and the displays, there will be a match in review order. And that is to signify that Dominica cannot stand still. Dominica must move forward. So we will march forward in 14 steps and halt. And we will have the presidential salute. I know we are Dominicans and we are patriotic. And so on that occasion, everybody in the stadium will stand attention. We move now to Point Michel, where residents there are concerned that efforts to recover dead bodies are slow. The remains of five people killed by Hurricane Maria at Point Michel are yet to be identified. The most recent discovery of human remains was at Sibuli Point Michel on Tuesday, October 31st. While that has not been officially identified, villagers believe it to be that of a woman in her 70s whose house was located where the corpse was found. Nine residents of Point Michel are confirmed dead since Hurricane Maria four of which have been identified. We already know that Jerome Daniel, Gary Grove, and Royston Tuse are among those identified. The body discovered, well, the next day, which the hurricane happened Monday, and then on the Tuesday morning, we discovered the body. Mm -hmm. Okay, where was this? Well, the body, well, we discovered the body close to his home. Mm -hmm. Close to his home. Maybe again, maybe he was trying to escape. Because I mean, we were living close to the ravine. We are, I mean, ex when I went when I went there the next day, I know there is no way he would survive. Where the ravine went down, I know there is no way he would survive. The next day, somebody came home and tell us my nephew gone. So he lived alone in the house. Yes, he lived alone in the house, close to the ravine, which we had a very huge ravine. And there are other people who lived in the same area. Well, he there. Did who are also missing. Yes, about, well, there was a mother with about three children. She had two girls, another one boy, which is one of the sons they discover. Mm -hmm. That's and Jerome that is, Daniel. That is Jerome Daniel. And then the, the two girls, they had their two children. Each of them had two children. One of the girls was there with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know the amount of body which is missing in Point Michel right now. We were really getting some scent and whatever, but for now, maybe some skeleton, which they cannot really recognize who is who. There are still people missing from the community since the September 18 hurricane. Some residents of Point Michel are concerned that no effort is being made to recover those dead bodies. We keep on taking scent at the back of our house. And we complaining, we tell them people about that. They never come to us up to now. It have a month. But now the scent is just cooling out, but they're supposed to come to dig the area there to see what's happening. Who did you speak with? Well, my neighbor and them spoke with them people from the village council. And some people that was making it wrong. My area I live, that is here all the people passed away. And your suspicion is that um, there are dead bodies covered under the rubble? It to be, because I don't think this animal could have that kind of scent. You know? So you see now, from that time now, you see they're getting bones all around. So that's why they're supposed to come at the back to see what is happening. Out of the 31 confirmed deaths island-wide related to Hurricane Maria, 26 have been identified. Police statistics also indicate that 34 people are confirmed missing. Idona John Baptist reporting for Channel 5 News. Next up, a high-level IFR official weighs in on the future of Dominica's endemic parrots. Dominica's native parrots are once again on the brink of extinction. The word from Kelvin Ailey, who is Executive Vice President of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, I4. Speaking to Channel 5 News ahead of his departure from Ireland recently, Ailey said that Hurricane Maria inflicted some serious damage on Dominica's wildlife and forests. 
from what I've seen before coming to Dominica, looking at the pictures and the videos um, with respect to the impact of Hurricane Maria, the damage across the island, both humanitarian um, and infrastructure damage, uh, and coming in and seeing it for myself in real life is quite painful to see. Uh, Maria has inflicted a serious damage on the island. Um, in terms of um, what we have seen, in terms of the wildlife, the habitat of the, both the imperial and the redneck parrot has almost been completely destroyed. Um, the, all the trees have lost their leaves. Uh, in particular, a lot of the trees that were nesting sites where the homes for these animals have completely been destroyed. Um, so one of the things we are very interested on is first of all looking at you know, um, the issue of injured and displaced parrots. Uh, a lot of birds that have been impacted by the storm, they may have been displaced, they have been injured because their homes have been damaged. And, and trying to look specifically at how we can help with uh, support for rescue to rehabilitate these birds and to release them back out in the wild. Um, in the longer term, obviously there has to be a, a plan, a strategic plan to look at uh, a species recovery program for both these animals. Uh, it is important for your, your viewers to, to know and understand that the two species of parrots that we have here are found nowhere else on earth, uh, the imperial and the red parrot. And the imperial parrot, which, is, which we call the Cicero parrot, um, is our natural heritage. It's on our coat of arms, it's on our flag. Uh, the highest civilian award that's uh, given is the Cicero Award. So you can just imagine, you know, the sort of role that is played in our culture and our natural heritage. So there has to be a long-term strategy to bring these animals back. Um, these animals are facing extinction. Um, yesterday, I had a chance to, to spend the day uh, walking through the syndicate area uh, in the forest with the Forestry and Wildlife Department. Uh, the syndicate area is the prime habitat. It is the stronghold where these birds are found and the habitats are completely destroyed. Uh, we were able to see some redneck parrots flying around, feeding uh, but clearly we did not hear or see any Cicero parrot, which is very concerning. And with, a, with, with an animal that, that is very low in number, um, and given the impact of Maria, uh, there are serious fears that um, the species might be on the brink of extinction, which would be, which is very worrying for me as a Dominican, but for me as somebody working in international conservation, uh, globally uh, trying to save threatened species from extinction. You've spoken a lot about our parrots and the threat of their extinction. Based on what you've seen thus far, are any of our other species under that sort of threat because of the hurricane? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yesterday, just going for syndicate, I came across a couple of uh, agoutis as well, and um, they were pretty much uh, foraging for food. We saw a couple of them with grapefruits in their mouth running around, but the animals looked very lean and thin, um, which is expected because a lot of the food source has been destroyed, right? Um, so there has to be a comprehensive strategy. When we say biodiversity, we also look at forest and wildlife. There has to be a serious uh, forest restoration program, you know, to sort of restore the forest that we have. In some cases, um, you know, the trees have been completely destroyed. They're going to, you know, we're going to have to look at an aggressive reforestation, replanting program. You know, when I worked with forestry back in the days, you know, we used to do a lot of reforestation and replanting in the Glogomi area and some of the other areas that were affected by Hurricane David. So there is going to be a, a, a national strategy. And I must say that, you know, it also has broader implications for Dominica because we are the nature island of the Caribbean. People come here to enjoy our nature and our biodiversity. Um, you know, our two endemic parrots, you know, attract a lot of, you know, enthusiasts and visitors that come to our shores to see these animals because you can see them nowhere else on earth. So when we talk about forest restoration, we talk about, you know, securing and protecting our wildlife, we're not just doing that just because. I mean, yes, it is, you know, a, a good um, uh, sort of conservation uh, thing to tackle, but it also has links to our, e our ecotourism product. That's what we sell. So if, we, if our forests come back and our animals come back, we're going to have more visitors coming to our shore. It's that simple, right? So, so there is going to have to be an all hands on deck approach to sort of to see how we can really do an aggressive program, you know, to bring these animals back uh, from the damage from Hurricane Maria. Based on the work you do with IFO, this isn't the first time you've actually come to a country after a devastating disaster and had to 
um, observe what happened to the wildlife. Based on your past experience, how optimistic should Dominica be that we can bring back our forest and our wildlife to what it used to be? And can you give examples of other places you've worked where you know you put a plan in place and it's actually benefited them? I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't even have to go outside of Dominica. I mean, I can use Dominica as an example. I mean, I work mm -hmm. internationally on a number of issues, yes, but I can give Dominica as a perfect example. And the perfect example is Hurricane David. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to Hurricane David, um, if you look at all the reports, uh, even from forestry, uh, in both the um, Imperial and the Red Lake Parrot, uh, the numbers were we were okay. I mean, we had what, you know, 2,500 or almost 3,000 redneck parrots, and we had almost, you know, you know, 500 to 600 Cicero parrots, and then Hurricane David came, uh, destroyed their habitat. You know, the Cicero parrots was left with only 50 individuals left. The Jacko parrots was dropped to between 100 to 200. So, uh, one of the things that has happened is after Hurricane David, there was a, a plan that was put in place um, to help restore these species and to bring them back from the brink of extinction including um, you know the setup of a, a sort of a long-term parrot monitoring and research program that is still happening today in the forestry department so there was a plan that was put in place um, there was international NGOs that came in a lot of donors showed interest in wanting to help these charismatic species um, we had as I said project Cicero where we had NGOs came in, we launched a, they launched a very aggressive conservation campaign, tried to get all Dominicans on board. I remember we used to have Voix Diablo 10 in the Chronicle at the time, talking about the birds and the plight of the birds and what we need to bring them back. And, you know, 20 years after, we're looking at the Mont Wapito National, we look at the Mont Wapito National Park, we look at the Mont Diablo 10 National Park, which was not there, which was established to protect the birds. And we, we were looking at, you know, 500 Ciceroos, and almost 3,000 redneck parrots, and then Maria come, and then the numbers go back down. So as a small island developing states, we are obviously threatened, um, heavily threatened, because of these intense storms, the magnitude of them, and the frequency of which they come. So I think it's going to be important as we look longer term, we look at a long-term strategy, not just how we secure these animals now, but in case of a disaster, how do we prepare ourselves to protect these animals longer term? Mr. Ailey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me on the program. And there we heard from Executive Vice President of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, Mr. Calvin Ailey, speaking to us on the organization's efforts to helping Dominica restore the population of its wildlife species and this reforestation project as we bring Dominica back to its former glory as the nature island of the Caribbean. Reporting for Channel 5 News, I am Andrea Louis. Finally, the Ministry of Justice reports progress in getting court proceedings back on track. Court proceedings are slowly coming back on stream in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Portsmouth is back in operation. St. Joseph and La Plaine are due to reopen on the 7th of November, while the Magistrates Court is due to reopen on November 13. Wesley and Marigot Magistrates Court have recommenced from the 23rd of um, October 2017 and we want to thank the police for working very closely with us on that one. In Vekas, however, the court is destroyed but the matters are being done in the Portsmouth Magistrates Court so that we do not lose any time. In terms of the Magistrates Court building, we are in the process of renting a new building for the Magistrates Court in Rosa so that we can resume sitting for courts three and four. The other services available from the court, they are available in both Portsmouth and Roseau, and that includes our cashing services, collection of maintenance, paying of maintenance, the collection of fines, the paying of civil costs. Registrar Ozzy Walsh has outlined a timeline for the reopening of the High Court. The registry has already resumed issuing certain certificates. The High Court Criminal Division, where I where the registry department is and where my office is located uh, suffered significant damage to the roof, maybe 30% damage to the roof and uh, a lot of damage internally as well. On that point, I want to take the opportunity to thank the Jamaican contingent who were with me on Friday last week based on the instructions of PS for to have them to come to have a look at the building, the damage done to the building, and to assess what can be done to repair it permanently. 
uh, much, 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 much faster than we have done so far. We have done a sort of um, temporary cover into the roof, and thanks to UPS for that. And um, the Jamaican contingent looked at the damage to the roof where they climbed the Nassif building to have a look at the, at the damage done to the, to the high court. We went to the, uh, the civil court, civil division of the Supreme Court. Uh, the roof is completely gone there. And the Jamaicans also looked at it with a view to see how they can remedy it. Uh, hopefully we'll get some assistance sooner rather than later to have both roofs um, repaired. Uh, in terms of the cleanup efforts, a significant amount of cleaning up has taken place. Both courts are cleaned more or less, uh, a little dust here and there, but the debris that was in the court have been cleared. Um, the, both courts are still not electrified, but we are working towards it to have it electrified sooner rather than later. The registry department, registry section of the court, um, registry, men in the civil registry, the probates registry, the deeds registry, the land registry, all this is housed in the main court building in the Bayfront. We have resumed um, civil registry activities. We are now being we're now able to issue life event certificates, thanks to UPS and the Honourable Minister for the initiative here and the and the and the push to get that done. Uh, the Honourable Minister was insistent that we should get the civil registry running quickly. It's up, it's running. The Minister has taken the initiative to speak with the Prime and Honourable Prime Minister to get alternative venue for the court, for court sitting to take place actually, because buildings bill are not going to be ready quite yet. We have to house the judges in different accommodations, as well as the actual build where the judges have to sit. Uh, it also has to be dealt with. We are looking at uh, the Honourable Minister told me that, well, through the PS, that we are looking at the, using the Parliament building um, to have the courts, both civil and criminal. It may have to be done on an alternative basis, maybe two days criminal, two days civil. That part hasn't been worked out as yet. We'll get to do that, I'm sure, by the end of this week. This has been a special edition of the Channel 5 News. Feel free to contact us at news at mapping2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the entire production team, I am Kenny Williams. To all viewers around the world, we thank you for watching. Join us next time.